us in Florida. Um, I want to, I've got a message here I wanted to share with you here in a minute, and I think might stir some things up with this message a little bit, and I'm kind of looking forward to that. But, <laughs> but before, before we do, I have a, we had a special prayer request that came in this morning, an email that came in from a person who faithfully views these uh, um, web messages, and this is our dear sister down in Oz, Australia, uh, Levina, who uh, sent me an email this morning and asked that if we would pray for her because of she's having chest pains and she's going through some emotional difficulty as a, as a result of this. So I said, you know what, we're going to pray for you. And I, I thought, well, we, prayed, we had some other prayer requests uh, during the announcements and the offering time, but she wouldn't know that. And I thought, well, let's pray for her so that she can see us. I'll pray for her. So just kind of stretch your hands toward the camera right now, would you please? Father, we just thank you for our sister right now. And we thank you, Lord, that there's no, no such thing as too short of a distance or too long of a distance between Australia and, and between Florida. And we just lift her up right now. We take authority over those chest pains right now in Jesus' name. We curse the chest pains, whatever it is that's causing this, and we speak life to her. We come against all fear. We come against all trepidation. We thank you, Lord, for what you did for her 2,000 years ago. And Lord, whatever's going on with her emotions, uh, maybe even some depression as a result of this, we speak against that right now. We command it to be broken off from you right now in Jesus' name. And we thank you, Lord. We bless her. We thank you, Lord, for her and all the others that would watch these videos. Father, we just pray for those that would be watching. Any other needs from, from anybody that's watching, just, just lay your hand right now on your computer as a point of contact, your, your television set, however you're watching, and we just speak life to you right now in Jesus' name. And we thank you and, and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. God bless you, sis. And uh, we're trusting that I hear back from you by the end of the day. No more pain. No more pain. <clears throat> well, the um, title um, I'd like to put on this message um, is this. I'd like to speak to you and just share with you some thoughts about the shocking truth, the shocking truth about hearing from God, from hearing God's voice. The shocking truth about hearing God's voice. And you're going to see why I'm calling it the shocking truth for, for a minute. Um, but before I go too far into it, I, I, I want to share just a thought that I've been playing with here for some time, not just recent thought, but, but for a long time actually. Um, I've been kind of convinced, fully convinced, matter of fact, that many maybe most Christians really do not know the voice of God. Now that may come to a shock, as a shock to you, especially if you're, you're the Pentecostal type or the charismatic type, because many of those uh, folks, God bless them all, but many of those folks run around all the time and, and they say something like this, God said this to me, or God told me that. Um, I would like to really encourage you all to do something for me and, and pray about this. Don't do it just because I'm asking you to do this. But, but I don't know if you notice me very much, because, but I don't use that terminology too much. And the reason why I don't use that terminology, that it, it's this, that if God said something to me, how many know there's no room for error in that? If God said it, then <laughs> he said it, and if God says something, it's got to happen. Now, once in a while, I'll tell people some things, and I'll say, you know, I'm feeling like maybe God is saying this to you. I'm sensing, but what am I doing? I'm leaving myself a little wiggle room. And the reason why I, I say that is because I am not God. And sometimes I might minister to you. I might say to Brother Ted here, I might say, Brother, God, God, God said this to you, and God said that. And, and the reason why maybe uh, I'm saying that to him is because I love my brother, you know, and I want good for him. 
And so what am I doing? I'm speaking good. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, okay? Because I'd rather have someone going around prophesying good things to me, even if they're not of God. I'd rather have them speaking good things, speaking life into my life, than some old negative bunch of garbage that none of us needs. But, but to say, you know, thus says the Lord, that's another thing. You know, a lot of charismatics and, and Pentecost prophecy, thus says the Lord, brother. Well, when you say a thus says the Lord, you better be right on. Because you've done, as soon as you say, thus says the Lord, or you say something like, God told me this, what you've done is you've just painted yourself in the corner. Come on. And I, I, I would rather not see us get into places like that. Because sometimes it can be just a bunch of embarrassment, and, um, you know, it's just, just not healthy. Sometimes it can really mess up people's lives. I've watched this, you know, I, I, for years and years and years, there, there, several years ago in the charismatic Pentecostal realm when Queen and I were traveling, um, preachers would go around, evangelists especially would go around, they'd come into a church, and they'd prophesy over every, primarily every young person, they'll say something like, well, God shows me, brother, God's called you to be an apostle. And I'd say, don't say that. Don't say that. Maybe indeed they have been called to be an apostle, but don't be telling them before they even know what an apostle is. And, and the reason is because you put a whole bunch of responsibility and a whole bunch of, you lay a trip on them right from the get-go. They don't need that. You know, it's bad enough, you know, to be called into the ministry. Come on, hear me. It's bad enough to be called into the ministry without having it done pre, prematurely. Because it is not. I, I would recommend to anybody, you say, well, I've been called into the ministry, I'd say, why? Go get a job where you can make a bunch of money, take care of your family, live a good retirement. Whatever you do, don't do that. Unless God has so called you into that that there's absolutely nothing else that you can do and have peace in your life, you see? It's not a, it's not a glamorous. People look at it and say, oh, it's such a glamorous thing. It's not. It's a burden on you folks. It's a burden. All right. So don't, please don't, try to get rid of that, that terminology, God told me this and God told me that, or God said this or God said that. You can say, maybe, I feel like maybe God said this, or maybe God said that, or I feel like God said, you know, that. give yourself a little wiggle room in that. And the reason is because if you're like me, you will find that some of the things that I thought God told me was not God at all. Come on. And God will never tell you to do something that's contrary to what all the stuff that we're talking about really is. For example, I had somebody just recently, I shared some this uh, last week in my message, this one guy was talking about the law, you know, that the law is for today, and, and just going on and on and on. Well, you know, in the more conversation over the week, um, it, it came out more and more and more that, you know, God's, God's called me, you know, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, but God's called me into Messianic Judaism. Now, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, because God would never do that to anybody that's fully in love with Jesus Christ. And I'm going I'm to prove it to you here in a little bit before I'm all done. Because I see, this is some of the shocking truth that I'm going to be sharing. It goes contrary to the word of God. So God will never call you or say something to you that's contrary to, to, to the teachings of the, the Bible, especially that of the new covenant. Amen. Now, I know that can ruffle some feathers. God will never call you back into something that he's not into because that is all over with. That was a temporary thing that was done with and now has nothing to do where you and I are living in. And, 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 and if you're still thinking there is, you've got some, some roots, as you, you people around here say, you roots, how do you say it? Roots, roots. I say roots, you always mock me. But, huh, you say roots, roots. God will never... He, listen, sever those roots or what, the roots or whatever you want to call them. Roots. Huh? Roots. Uh, can't win. So, let's, let's look at some things. So how does God speak to us? Now, now, there's absolutely no way in the world 
Um, I have to keep this again to 50 minutes so Joe Kelly's going to watch it. But um, there's no way in the world I can cover all of the ways that God speaks to his people in these days. But I, I want to share just a few, and, and part of it is, and some of this is not new, and, but, but the reason why I want, wanted to go through some of this stuff is because I want to get it recorded, okay? That we can use it as teaching. Uh, maybe some on the internet have never heard some of this stuff. Hopefully I'm going to be sharing some things with you that will be kind of new and, and again, maybe stir up some things. I, the main thing is I want you guys to think. I really want you to think. Don't swallow the Kool-Aid. Don't swallow the religious Kool-Aid that we've been poured. Begin to think for yourself. I'm going to show you some good things to think about. The first way that I see the, the Lord speaking to us today this is found in, in Hebrews. Uh, I have enough time. Let's look at chapter 8. We can look at chapter 10 too. This is nothing new. Uh, in, in the early days when we first began to come into the, the, the understanding of the new covenant, we preached and taught a lot about Jeremiah chapter 31 verses 31 through whatever. And, and the reason is, is because uh, it, God says, I'm going to give you a new covenant. And in Hebrews chapter 8, I believe Paul is the man who wrote the book of Hebrews. Can't say that for sure, but my own personal belief is. But Paul repeats this, and, and he says this in verse um, 7. If the first covenant had been faultless, there would, be no, there would have been no need for a second covenant to replace it. So right away, for anybody who says that the law is still in effect, guess what? You're wrong. It's been replaced. It's been replaced. But verse 8, but when God found fault with the people, he said, the day is coming, says, now this is a direct quote from Jeremiah, the day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. They did not remain faithful to my covenant, so I turned my back on them, says the Lord. But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel on that day, says the Lord. Here we go. I will put my laws in their minds, and I will write them on their hearts. I put my laws in their minds, and I will write them on their hearts. Does that sound like the work of the Holy Spirit to you? So the very first way that when, when we're living in the time of the new covenant like this, the very first way we can expect God to speak to us is through the Holy Spirit. Number one, it's got to be through the Holy Spirit. And Whatever he does, he will illuminate, for instance, the Bible, he will illuminate the verses that you are to read with the Holy Spirit to come into your heart to bring life. Now, he also says, uh, and, and I will be their God, uh, and they will be my people, and they will not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they need to teach their relatives, saying you should know the Lord. For everyone from the least to the greatest will know me already, and I will forgive their wickedness, and I will never again remember their sins. I will never again remember their sins. And that's important. Uh, I sometimes ask people, what part of never again do you not understand? All right? Then in verse 13, when God speaks of a new covenant, it means that he has made the first one obsolete, it is out of date, and it will soon disappear. Whoa. Now, how many know it fully disappeared in, in, um, in 70 AD when Titus indeed did uh, take over Jerusalem, and there would be no way that they could continue on with any form of Judaism because the temple was completely destroyed, right? But it began 70 years earlier when Jesus Christ died on the cross. The covenant actually began. The new covenant began at, at the death of Jesus Christ. He immediately took his own blood to heaven. He poured it out upon the mercy seat there, and at that moment of time, the old ended and the new began. See, that's why the cross, and that's why Jesus said on the cross, his last words on the cross are, it is finished. Done. Ended. Okay? But Paul goes on to say that that old covenant, 
It has made the, the old one, the new one has made the old one obsolete. It is now out of date and it will soon disappear. So the number one way of, of listening to God, of hearing the voice of God in our lives is through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. That is number one. That is primarily, if you have the Holy Spirit, you will never go wrong. Now it's been said, and I fully agree with this, if I knew in advance that I was going to be marooned on a desert island all by myself, and I had a choice, I could either bring my Bible or I could bring the Holy Spirit, it'd be the Holy Spirit every time. You understand that? That's not diminishing the Bible. That's not taking away from the Bible. It's been said that if you have the Bible alone, the Word alone, you will... Huh? You will... Dry up. Exactly right. You've heard it. If you have the Holy Spirit alone, you will blow up. If you have the Holy Spirit and the Bible together, you will grow up. And I really believe that that's a good balance. The Holy Spirit, along with the Bible, is very, very essential. So we see, and, and we're not ones, there are some unfortunately in the, in the New Covenant uh, movement today, the Grace Movement, that are taking away from the Bible, and we're not. But the Bible, I want you to understand, the Bible in itself is perfect. Man's interpretation of the Bible isn't always perfect. And that's our problem. We shared even last week the four, our four different rules for correct Bible interpretation. Don't want to get into it all right now again. But um, I, I believe that it's essential that we understand those four rules will indeed help us and will make a big difference in our lives. But um, we know that when the still small voice of the Holy Spirit comes and works along with the Bible, we're going to see some great things take place as a result of this. Now, one of the problems that we have with the Bible, and a lot of it is in interpretation, and it is man's involvement with the Bible. Matter of fact, we recently, Corinne and I were watching a history program on the way the Bible was translated and di different versions and some of these different things that came. And one of the problems that we have, part of the problem that you and I have, now I say things like this and sometimes it gets people upset at me, but one of the problems that we have even with the King James Bible is we have a lot of Catholic influence into it. And in the early days, because King James was the head of the Church of England in the day, but King James, again, was not a godly king, by the way, so don't get fooled by that. Um, I don't want to get into all that right now. But, but part of the problem is, is that when Henry VIII left the Catholic Church, all right, he did so only because he wanted to marry all these different wives. Anne Boleyn, I believe, was the one that brought it up. He wanted to end his marriage with Anne because she could not give him a male son, an heir. And so he had to get the permission from the Pope to end his marriage with Anne. The Pope says, no, I'm not going to do it. And so Henry said, fooey on you, Pope, I'm going to start my own church. <laughs> and so, Exactly right, that's what they all say, good, Karen, that's good, people say, um, so, so he left the Catholic Church, started the Church of England, took care of Anne, had her head cut off, didn't divorce her, just chopped her head off. Um, I'm not going to go there too much, but you know, that, that was the way he took care of his problem. All, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't because they didn't love each other, couldn't have, you know, they, didn't, they were arguing, all, it was only because she could not produce a male son. She had a some daughters and different things. I don't remember how many, but off with her head. That's how important this heir, this male heir, was for, for Henry VIII. So he ended up killing her. But here's the deal. He started the Church of England, but guess who he started the Church of England with? A bunch of Catholics. And so all of the bishops and the cardinals and all these people who were Catholics they, they got thinking to my, themselves, now hold it, I, I live here in London, okay? I, I am a 
bishop or I am a cardinal or I'm a priest or whatever and I'm a monsignor, whatever I, you know, whatever I am, I'm living here in London and I can see the castle right down yonder. Henry lives there. He's starting this new church. Now the Pope is several thousand miles away in Rome. All right? So well, let's see here. Common sense. This guy already just took his wife and said to the chopping block, because she didn't, couldn't produce a son, um, maybe, just maybe, I better join the Church of England and leave the Catholic Church behind. It might be better for my neck. Plus, they're very wealthy people. The bishops and the cardinals in those days were the aristocracy of the country. They were wealthy people, you know. They, they took the money from the common people and they brought it into themselves. And it, 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 was a, it was a mess, selling indulgences and all these different things. Guess who kept all that, you know? So a really wrong, now, now my Catholic friends really get upset with me when I, when I, when I talk about things like that. But so all you got to do is read your history books. Don't believe, don't believe me, just read the history books. And, and find out yourself, again, don't swallow the Kool-Aid. I don't care if you're Pentecostal, I don't care if you're Charismatic, I don't care if you're Methodist, Baptist, whatever, don't swallow the Kool-Aid. Start thinking for yourself. Can anybody say amen? amen. Too many Christian believers have swallowed the Kool-Aid. Right. What a mess it makes. You see, if you swallow the Kool-Aid and it's good Kool-Aid, then good swallow it, you know. But if it's the bad stuff, uh-uh, it's not going to do you any good. Start thinking for yourself. So when I'm saying this stuff, I'm not, I'm not anti-Catholic. I have friends who are Catholics. I love a lot of Catholic people. Um, I believe that there are many in the Catholic Church. So we're going to see them in heaven when we get there. But, that's, but I'm just telling you some history. And the problem is, is that a lot of the doctrine that was Catholic doctrine then was brought into the Church of England and it was brought into the writing of the King James Bible. And when you deal with issues such as the sin issue, guess where that came from? It was not the things that Paul was teaching. It was translation problems that were brought. Now, right away, you see, as some of these early scribes, because remember, Johann Gutenberg didn't discover the printing press until years after all of this. So the common person could not have, you know, we have, I probably, what do we have, 10, 12 Bibles in our house. I don't know. We have, we, you go online, you got them on your cell phone, you got them on your, 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 your device, your portable device, and you got them on your computer. You got, we got Bibles all over the place. Back then they couldn't, they didn't have one. They had no Bible to refer back to. You see, and I've often said, how in the world could the early church, those people who were persecuted, who were killed, thrown into the lions, and all these kinds of things, crucified even, how did they live in victory? We said, well, just read the word, brother. They had no word to read. How could they do it? You see, Holy Spirit. They had a relationship with God that got them through all this stuff. All right. You see the problem. So they didn't have, they had little old guys, you know, I could sitting there at desks, writing in longhand. Here's a copy of the Bible, and well, we, we need to produce uh, uh, two or three of them this year. <laughs> and, 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 and that'll be, and literally, they would be handwriting in longhand in their, their graphic form, they would be handwriting and copying the Bible. Now, you know, how many hours a day are they going to be doing this? So here they are, you know, Monk Joseph over here is, is, is copying in dim light, only with a candle over it. It's getting a little dark outside, you know. And he's saying, man, I've got to copy word for word from this other manuscript. So I'm, I'm making this new manuscript over here, and I'm writing over here. And boy, how many know sometimes on my computer, sometimes I have a hard time staying awake. And all of a sudden my, my head will start, but what did I just do? I, I mean, I, have let, I remember when I was writing my book, I'd literally fall asleep in the middle of a chapter. What, you know, what did I do there? And I'd, and I'd have to come back to it. As I'd be right there with my laptop on my lap, snoring away. You know, and, and here's what's really bad about that. You fall asleep and you got your finger on a key. I've done it. 
So here he is, Monk Joseph, and he's copying, and all of a sudden, is that a the or is that an and? And it's really a the, but golly, I was a little sleepy and I wrote an and. There are literally cases, and, and we've seen copies of this, where there were people that oversaw Monk Joseph, and they literally put a circle around something and inserted a different word in there because Monk Joseph made a mistake when he was copying that down. Now, I'm not trying to take away from the inerrancy and the accuracy of the Bible. What I'm trying to show you is, is that if you have the Holy Spirit ministering and moving in your life, it don't make any difference. Because he's going to lead you into truth. That's why we discovered one the other day. There's a verse missing out of, what chapter and verse was that? Do you remember? One of the Gospels. Matthew something, it goes from verse 12 to 15. It, verse 14 is completely missing. No, 14 is gone. So it doesn't make any difference, but we found it. We found it, and it's right there. Now, what you, what you have to understand is it says... Guess what? And it's not just the New Living Translation. It's several of the versions that say this. And there's a little footnote underneath there, and it's picked up in the footnote. Because probably what happened, that overseeing scribe caught that mistake and said, let's fix it. I mean, come on. Come on. You can read two Bibles. The one I have a hard time with, to be honest with you, is the NIV. I have a very hard time with the NIV because there's just too many. And I found out that the NIV is based upon the minority amount of text versus the majority text, like the King James, the New Living comes from the majority. Uh, there, there, there's just too many things. Like the Revised Standard, whole chapters are missing from the, what is it? Matthew 23 and verse 14. Matthew 23 verse 14 is missing. And it's not just the New Living, there's several versions. Look it up. Who's got a King James? I don't remember if I checked that. You got a King James, Emma? 23, verse 14. Yeah. Yeah, they do refer to it. Isn't that something? 14. What version you got, Jenny? I've got New Living. New Living? Yeah. Huh? What, verse 14? Matthew 23, 14, is it there? It's linked together. Yeah, it's linked together. 14 and 13 are linked together. Yeah. 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 So, isn't that interesting? You see? Isn't that interesting? Now, I'm not trying to diminish. I'm not trying to take away the importance of our Bible. Please, if you think that that's what I'm saying, you are hearing me wrong. But I'm showing you some problems here that we have and exactly why we need the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We need the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now, let's carry this just a little bit further because I think this really fits into some things here. Um, let's just take it another step. And let's go to uh, second, the famous verse in 2 Timothy, chapter and now, again, I've, I apologize for some of you who have heard some of this teaching before. I think we've covered some of this on Wednesday nights before. But, but let's do it. And again, I want to get it on video here. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Chapter 3, verse 16. 2 Timothy 3, 16. The famous for, uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 that probably most of us can quote by heart. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong with our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Now, here's the problem that I run into all of the time with my teaching. Or any of us grace teachers, Joseph Prince runs into this, Drake runs into this, anybody who's preaching New Covenant grace is going to run in a problem with this verse of Scripture, these two verses of Scripture. And what they will say is that, you know, you can't say what you're saying and, and, and you can't disregard the Old Covenant and those verses in the Old Testament because of this, this, this passage of Scripture. Paul says... You can't get rid of it because what, what's he saying here? It's, uh, you know, it's really heavy-duty stuff. He says, look, that scripture, it's given, it corrects us when we're wrong. 
It corrects. Now, I've been called all the time. Um, there, there's a real fancy word for it. I can't remember what it is, and I don't care about it anyway. But there's a real, it's, it's anti-something, and, and it's somebody that's against the law. All right? You are right. When they call me that, I say, that's me, brother, because I am against the law. Why? I just read it to you during the offering. The law has, the old law is obsolete. It's no longer in force for you and I today. So if we're trying to live our lives not only according to that law, as I said last week, any law that would kind of, sort of, in our own thinking, would make us somehow feel closer to God, then we're missing it. We're missing out what Jesus Christ has fully done for our lives. There is only one law for you and I to follow today in the New Covenant. It is the law of love. It will never be replaced. All right? So are we totally lawless? No. And I, I tell them that. No, I follow the law. I follow the law, brother. I follow the New Covenant law. It's the law of love. I love you anyway. Well, sometimes I get in the flesh a little bit and think, you know, I love you anyway, even though you're kind of a jerk. The way you're doing this, the things you're saying, I mean, you know, come on. Yeah, you know? And, and I'll be honest with you, I've been hitting the unfriend button a lot lately. I've been hitting the unfriend button, and some of them I'm even actually hitting the block button. You know, because who needs it? I mean, you just don't need it. All right, it's form of ministry, but you see, again, there's so much, that's, there's so much goofy stuff out there. So what is the scripture that Paul is talking about here? He says that all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and make us realize what is wrong. Is he talking about those, those verses of scripture, those chapters back in the Old Testament under the Torah, the books of the law? Is that what he's talking about? Is Paul actually talking about that? Is he saying that that is really good? Because if he does, then I have a problem. Then I'm teaching you wrong stuff, you see? Now, in order to understand this a little bit more, Let's, let's, uh, let, let's look at some things here. And, and again, going back to what I, I said earlier, let's think a little bit. Let's think a little bit. <clears throat> this is really interesting to me, and, I, and I've never fully covered this to this degree before as I'm about to do, and, and I, this, may, this is where the shock value comes in, okay? I'm about ready to dump a whole bunch of shock on you. And, and, and some of you are going to say, well, I see what you're saying, Larry, because you're thinking. Some of you, if you've got that religious tradition that's going to rise up in you, you're probably not going to like about what I'm going to say. But, but I want you to think, <clears throat> and I want you to look at some truth here. He says in verse 16, all Scripture. Think. Well, I started thinking about it this week a little bit more. I've thought about it many times in the past. But I've started thinking about it some more this week, and I thought, all Scripture, what is the Scripture that Paul is talking about here? This is definitely Paul, this is Paul's letter to, to his disciple Timothy. All Scripture. The interesting thing is, I looked it up, and I've never done it before. This is a Strong's Concordance. Does everybody know what a Strong's Concordance is? How many have one at home? All right? Probably most of us have one. <clears throat> the Strong's is the very basic. You can buy one for $29.95 at the bookstore. You, you can get them for nothing online, you know. It is the very basic means of translating words from either the Hebrew or the Greek. And what you do is you, it's all based on King James. You have to have a, you have to have a knowledge of your King James, but you have to have a, usually a King James Bible to work with it. But you can find a verse of Scripture. If you find a verse of Scripture in your New Living Translation, Jenny, and you say, well, I'm going to find, read it up in the King James, then get that word in the King James and then take it to your Strong's. All right? And that's a good study means anyway. It's good to take a few different types of versions of the Bible and, and check them out and different things. That it helps you. But it, 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 it comes to that, and, and you look up the word, and then in the first part of the book is all Hebrew. The second part, because it's, the New Testament is shorter, there's a little bit less in the New Testament than there is in the Old Testament, but the, probably the last third of the book is in the Greek. And so what you do is you look the word up in the actual concordance, and it shows you all the places where it's used, both in, 
in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. All right? The word scripture. I look up the, new, the word scripture and found that it had a number to it. And the number was a Greek number because I'm looking for a New Testament word, so it's in the Greek. It had a Greek number, a New Testament number, of 1124. And so what I did is I looked up 1124 in my Strong's and find that it's referring to, because 1124, that Greek word is graphe, and it's, it's from another word, it's from another word, which is graphio, all right? And so it can either be a verb, that's a verb, but in its noun form, and that's what we're looking for, it's noun form here, scripture. It's noun form, it's not a verb, it's a noun. So what we're finding here is that the original word is graphe, and again, directly from Strong's, its first definition is a document, a document, not a Bible, not the Old Testament, not the New Testament, a document. Who's got good eyes? Right there. A document. A document. Document. A document. Right from Strong's, a document. Kind of interesting, huh? Have you ever heard it taught that way before? Because what do most of us, when we hear the word scripture, what's the first thing that comes to our mind? Huh? How many have heard it would believe it would be Bible? It's not. It's a document. Now, the interesting thing about it is, is that there's an I-E here. And an I-E is simply this. It means, that is to say. So it is a document, that is to say, and it goes on to say right here, here's the exact reading of it, a document, I-E, holy writ. Holy writ. Thirdly, it can mean scripture. It can mean scripture. But a holy writ and this is different. I mean, I've heard the word holy writ, and I thought, what in the world does holy writ mean? Holy writ simply means Christian writings. Holy writ simply means Christian writings. So I got thinking about that a little bit. Now, you ready for some shock value here? Huh? Are you ready for some shock value? I want to show you a form of scripture. Here's a form of scripture. It's my book. Come on, does it or does it not agree with the Greek rendering of the word scripture? It is what? A document? Huh? And guess what? It is holy writ because it is Christian writings. Now, how many are having that religion kind of rise up here a little bit with what I just said? Huh? Whoa. Am I saying this is equal to the Bible? I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying that at all. Because don't go wrong thinking that, because that's I'm not going there. But what I'm saying is my book is there's some other books. We got a couple Joseph Prince books back there, some Mark Drake books. Guess what? They they fit the bill of scripture. They fit the bill of scripture. Now, how about that for a little bit of something to make you think? Huh? Whew. Huh? Am I in trouble, Joe? <laughs> All right. Here's the problem. Now, stop and think about this. Holy Writ is Christian writing. So, if I go back to the book of the law, books of the law, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, all scripture is given. Is Paul talking about this? Huh? Is this Christian writing? Who is this being written to? Jews. Who are what? Under the living in the 
So is Paul talking about that at all? It's not even, get this now, ooh, here I am walking on thin ice again. Guess what? It's not Christian writings. It's not the scripture that Paul's talking about. Now, when there's types and shadows of Christ, you bet. The Holy Spirit can take the book of Deuteronomy and show you something that is for your life. But the Holy Spirit can do it. If you just take it on your own, you're going to get wrapped up into a prayer, an area you don't want to really get wrapped up into. But the Holy Spirit, see, again, going back to the Holy Spirit. So we come into this to prove this point just a little bit further here. And, and, I, and I share this whenever I get hit by this. You know, people say, well, you know, we're still under the law then. And then I said, well, you, you got a real problem here because, again, as we read it during the offering time, that, 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 that old law, that old covenant is, is obsolete and being replaced by the new. But, but in 2 Corinthians, now remember this, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, when someone's talking this nonsense to you, talk to them about 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And, and let's listen to this. Let's read it. I've got enough time here. Let's read it from verse 1. I'm not going to comment on all this. But again, I'm trying to keep this all in context for you so that you see I'm not just blowing a bunch of smoke here. I'm, I'm really bringing you some truth on this stuff. And you say, why, why does this make a difference? It makes a big difference. It makes a big difference on how you're going to live victoriously in your Christian life. All right, chapter 3, verse 1. Are we beginning to praise ourselves again? Are we like others who need to bring you letters of recommendation or ask you to write such letters on their behalf? Surely not. The only letter of recommendation we need is you, you yourselves. Your lives are a letter written in our hearts. The Holy Spirit at work there even in Paul's life. Everyone can read and recognize our good work among you. Verse 3, clearly you are Christ, showing the result of our ministry among you. This letter is written not with pen and ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. Hello? The Spirit of the living God. It is carved not on tablets of stone, which would be what? The Ten Commandments. It is not carved on tablets of stone, but in what? On human hearts. All right? Now, we are confident of all this because of our great trust in, in God through Christ. It is not that we think we are qualified to do anything of our own. Our qualification comes from God. He has enabled us to be ministers of his new covenant. This is a covenant. Now, look at this. This is a covenant not of written laws, but of the Spirit. The old covenant ends in death, but under the new covenant, the Spirit gives life. So, so I'm going to ask you, brothers and sisters, and those of you that would be watching on the Internet today, would Paul then be saying in 2 Corinthians chapter 3.16 that, that all that Scripture is good for doctrine and reproof and training and all that? Would he be saying that about Scriptures that he says in another place are leading to death? Think! Think! think there's a contradiction there and it's a big one it's a big one and you know what i'm telling you something you know what you're probably the only church in the face of the earth that's ever heard some of this stuff i'll guarantee i even amongst grace preachers i've never heard this this message taught or preached think think this stuff is so very important to us because if we don't understand this we're going to get ourselves into a whole lot of trouble. We're always going to be wondering why we cannot be free in Christ. Because we're always going to be going back to some type of form of legalism. Because we just can't seem to be free from the garbage that wants to haunt us and, and just track us down and, and live with us all the time. So here's Paul saying, this is a covenant not of written laws, but of the Spirit. The old written covenant ends in death, but under the new covenant, the Spirit gives life. You want to have life in your life, then guess where you're going to find it? You're going to only find it in the new covenant. You're not going to find it in the old. All right, now, that's why I say to you, I'm saying to anybody on online, listen to me. If you are a new believer in Jesus Christ, we say, read the book of John for new believers. Don't read the book of John. Get in those epistles. Understand what Paul's teaching. I'm going to show you. I'm going to prove this to you in a minute. 
The old way, verse 7, now again, this, this just verifies more what I'm saying here. The old way with the law is etched in stone. Ten commandments, right? Led to death, though it began with such glory that the people of Israel could not bear to look at Moses' face, for his face shone with the glory of God, even though the brightness was already fading away. Should we expect far greater glory under the new way now that the Holy Spirit is giving life? If the old way which brings condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the new way which makes us right with God? In fact, that first glory was not glorious at all compared with the overwhelming glory of the new way. So if the old way which has been replaced, has been replaced, past tense, was glorious, how much more glorious is the new which remains forever? Since the new way gives us such confidence, we can be very bold. We are not like Moses, who put a veil over his face so people, the people of Israel would not see the glory, even though it was destined to fade away. But the people's... Now listen to me very closely, folks. Listen to me very carefully. Understand this. Learn these verses. Because you may not be dealing with it now, but you will deal with it. You will deal with people that will come to you and say, what do you mean? The law is still in force. Listen to me. You will. The people's minds were hardened, verse 14, and to this day, what is today? Is he talking about today? And to this day, whenever the old covenant is being read, the same veil covers their minds so that they cannot understand the truth. Larry Silverman is not saying this. The Apostle Paul is. It's right here. It's been here all along. Now look at, it gets neat here. <clears throat> yes, even today, verse 15. Oh, hold it, verse 14 again. Their minds were hardened, and to this day, whenever the old covenant is being read, the same veil covers their minds, so they cannot understand the truth. And this veil can be removed only by believing in Christ. Now people say, well, I believe in Christ. I'm saved. I believe in Jesus. Uh-uh. You're believing in, it's not what he's talking about there. He's talking about believing in what? Christ has done. Do you believe that when Jesus died on the cross, he said it is finished? Do you believe that in every aspect of your life? If you do, then you believe in Christ. If you don't, if there's still stuff, listen to me, if you think you're a sinner, you think you still can sin, guess what? You're not believing in Christ. You are not believing in Christ. Come on. He either died for the sins of the world or he did. It's all here. Come on. I will never remember their sins. Never. What part of never do we not understand? All right. Verse 16, whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away, for the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us have had that veil removed, can see and reflect the glory of the Lord, and the Lord who is the Spirit makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. I would like to submit to you, that's what, exactly what Paul is talking about in, in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 3.16. And or in 2 uh, Timothy 3.16, I'm, sure, I'm sorry, I got it wrong. Let, let, let's look at Ephesians real quickly. Let's wind this down. Excuse me, Thessalonians. I'll get it right. First Thessalonians chapter 2, and listen carefully now, verse 13. Therefore we never stop thanking God that when you received his message from us, you didn't think of our words as mere human words. You accepted what we said as the very word of God, which of course it is. And this word continues to work in you who believe. Believe what? Believe in the words that Paul writes and speaks. Listen to me. Paul is saying in 2 Corinthians 3.16, when he refers to that all scripture, let, let, let's read it again. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 2 Timothy 
man, why am I getting all, all these scriptures here? And I'm in a hurry trying to get this all settled for Joe. Second, <laughs> Second Timothy chapter 3, it's all his fault. <sighs> all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. What is Paul talking about? Paul is talking about his teaching. He is referring to the words, the things that he himself taught. And why does he call it the word of God? Because who did he receive this from in the first place? He spent three years in the desert of Arabia receiving this word from Jesus Christ himself. Therefore, it qualifies as the word of God. Glory to God. Now, I want to do one more thing. One more thing. <clears throat> Brother Emmett, in his tremendous teaching, would you take some and pass them on, please? Just take one for family, maybe. <clears throat> Brother Emmett shares these confessions with us just about every Wednesday night. He comes up, he's got a, he's got a handout for those of you. I mean, these Wednesday nights are powerful, just some powerful. Joe last Wednesday night, my gosh. Just, just did an awesome job, just an awesome job. And Emmett, um, Emmett Anderson is, let me just say, I am so thankful for that, my brother. He has just been a tremendous addition to our church. And if you have, get to know him, you know, pick his brain once in a while. And, you know, you have a hard time understanding him. But, um, <laughs> Jung Ju starting to, she started to learn English with an Alabamian accent. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really something. But, he passed this up. This one, this is about a, two, three months ago, maybe, maybe longer. And, and this is the one, I love this one, brother. I love this one. And, and here's what I want us to do. And, and because it talks about this stuff, about hearing the word of God. Uh, uh, do we have enough to go around? Are they coming around good? Okay. Is there going to be enough, Ange? Huh? One for family? Huh? And let's, let's just put it this way. If you already have one at home, okay, Karen's got one at home. If you already have one of these at home, maybe give it up. Is there? Is there plenty? Oh, okay. There looks like there's going to be enough. Looks like there's going to be enough, Karen. All right. We have this on our refrigerator door. And several times during the week, I don't do this every day. I'll be honest with you. I don't, I don't feel led to do it every day. I follow the Holy Spirit. I'm, I, this is not a religious event for me, but I follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Yesterday morning, or the other, I think it was Friday morning, just going through some things. I, I was up fixing to go fishing, and I thought, yeah, oh, man, I'm all alone here. And I just read it out loud. I don't read it real loud to wake up crane or man anything like that. Just read it. So, But I do read it out loud in a low voice because I believe it's important to speak these words out loud. But can, can we all read this together a minute? I, I've, got a, I've got something I want to go with on this, but, but I think it's going to be a blessing to it. Let, let's try to read it together. I believe with all my heart and I confess with my mouth that the Word of God is true. Now, now we understand what the root Word of God is, don't we? Now, do we understand? Does that help us understand what it is? The teachings of Paul. The teachings of Paul. The, the teachings of the new covenant. I believe that this is true. The word of God is eternal. The word of God is alive. The word of God is changeless. I choose this day to set my life in agreement with the word of God. I choose right now to set my life in opposition to the devil. I choose to disagree with Satan, the world system, and all the powers of darkness. I say with my mouth and believe with my heart that I am a child of God. Hallelujah. Because I am a child of God, I am a child of light, and I hate darkness. I command, now put your hand, if you've got something going on in your body right now, 
I command my physical body. Come on. I command my physical body to resist sickness, weakness, infirmity, disease, and stress. I command my tongue to speak the word of God. I cast out every spirit of fear by releasing the perfect love that is within me through the Holy Ghost. I refuse to worry, be anxious, get upset, be impatient, or to doubt. I am at this very moment a possessor of divine life. My mind is sound and stable, and my physical strength is being renewed day by day. Get this now. I am not getting older. I am getting better. I am not growing weaker. I'm growing stronger. All my needs have already been met. I'm lacking in absolutely nothing. I am dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. I am abiding, abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. The Lord is my strength. The Lord is my refuge. The Lord is my fortress. The Lord is my God. And Him alone will I trust. Glory. Hallelujah. Now, how many, how many feel better about yourself right now than when you walked in that door? I, I defy you. I defy you to have this hanging on your refrigerator door and, and when you read it to feel bad about yourself. Man, if this won't straighten you out, it'll fix you up so quickly. I mean, it's just going to be an instant, to, it's just an instantaneous thing. So, Father, we thank you. And we praise you, and we give you glory. We thank, oh my God, we thank you. Come on. Glory to God. We thank you, Lord, for what you have done for us. And we praise you for it in Jesus' name. You know what? I'm not even going to ask to pray for people. And I'm going to tell you why I'm not going to ask to pray for people at the end. Usually we say, if anybody needs prayer at the end of the service, guess what? If you didn't get it from this, there ain't nothing that my hands laid on you are going to do. Come on. Come on, just receive it right now in Jesus' name. You just prayed for yourself and you don't even know it. Glory to God. God bless you. We love you. And uh, hope to see you Wednesday night, if not before. And God bless you on the internet. I just trust that this didn't shake up your world too much. But please, please, please think. And uh, please, please, please just keep plugged into Jesus Christ. Because, again, as we say around here in this church, there is no law but love. God bless you. We love you, and we'll see you next time.